Hello, good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Jennifer Gunn. I'm the director of the Institute for Advanced Study and I wanna welcome you to the first IAS Thursday of the spring semester. And uh, in keeping with trying to be as accessible as possible, I'll describe myself. I am a 60s white woman with uh, curly gray hair, glasses. And in the background, you'll see my favorite accessories in life, books and bookshelves. Um, Thank you guys for joining us today. The IS Thursdays uh, series is designed to bring ideas, conversation, and viewpoints from a wide range of scholars to the heart of the university, and in turn is designed for scholars from all walks of life. I do want to acknowledge as we begin today that wherever you are joining us from, we are all located on the traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of indigenous people. The University of Minnesota's Twin Cities campus resides on Dakota land, seated in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. The Institute for Advanced Study acknowledges that this place has a complex and layered history. And this land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and community about this land and our relationships with it and with each other. The IAS is committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples. Um, before we get started, I have a few announcements. We have several funding opportunities and programmatic opportunities available right now. The Institute for Advanced Study is coordinating the internal review and selection process for a, the John E. Sawyer uh, seminar proposal uh, funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And the Sawyer seminars convene intensive interdisciplinary study primarily but not exclusively in the arts, humanities, and interpretive social sciences. Proposals are due by noon, March, uh, Tuesday, March 1st. Also, the MinDrive Human in the Data Summer Graduate um, Fellowships will fund summer research and a workshop for graduate students, primarily in the arts, uh, humanities, and humanistic social sciences, who are addressing data and and one of the five uh, men drive thematic areas. Uh, eight fellows will be selected and um, receive a stipend of $7,000 for the summer. Uh, applications, as you can see, are, are due uh, Monday, March 7th. And um, this is a good lead in into next week's IAS Thursday, which is in fact, um, will feature Jim Wilgenbush from Research Computing, um, the source of the funding for the, for the MinDrive um, Human in the Data Initiative, and summer fellows from last year presenting on their work. And at, at 5 p.m. after the close of the regular IAS Thursday, we'll have a 30-minute information session for people interested in applying. Um, last, but definitely not least, several of today's featured companies have additional activities coming up at Northrop. You can see Paul Taylor Dance Company live in person next week on February 12th, and the Martha Graham Dance Company will be live at Northrop on April 2nd. As many of you probably know from, from um, well, way too long experience now with Zoom, uh, I'm, I wanna give you a few technical instructions. We've enabled the Zoom auto captions today and to enable that, click on the live transcript button on the bottom uh, bar of your, um, of your computer or if you're on a phone, it's usually in the top right-hand menu. Then select show subtitle titles or view full, full transcript. We'll have time for audience questions at the end of the event this afternoon. If you have questions for our speakers at any time during, uh, during the event, please enter them in Zoom's Q&A feature and you'll see the Q&A um, 
little double balloons down on that bottom bar, uh, Zoom bar on your computer. And I wanna make a distinction. The chat is enabled. You can talk to each other through the chat, but if you have a question for the presenters, please put it in the Q&A box. And, uh, and if you accidentally put it in the chat, we'll prompt you to, to go put it in the Q&A box. Um, okay. Um, and if you do want a message to go to anybody, be sure that in chat, be sure that your message um, is going to all panelists and attendees when you send it. So I wanna thank our, our co-sponsor Northrop for this fabulous program today, and particularly Kristen Brogdon who has pulled it together. And, uh, and without further delay, I am going to pass the stage over to Kristen Brogdon, who is Northrop's Director of Programming, uh, who will introduce today's event and, and guests. So thank you so much and on to you, Kristen. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And I'm thrilled to welcome our guests today. As Jennifer mentioned, my name is Kristen. I am a white woman with blonde hair and blue glasses. Today, I am wearing a gray sweater over a black shirt with a silver necklace, and you can see some dance photos and some prints behind me here in my office. I wanted to give a little bit of context for today's panel. All of the companies represented on the panel have received commissions from Northrop to create new work, and all of them are companies that are named for their founders who have an important place in 20th century dance history. This is part of what we need when we talk about legacy companies, which is something that you'll probably hear a lot today. Uh, I'll also mention that our partners in the Institute for Advanced Study are committed to hosting timely conversations about the issues of today. So while all of the companies represented were foundational to modern dance as an art form, um, our conversation today will also include the future of dance and the role that these three companies have in shaping that future. For their Northrop commissioned works, all three of these companies have commissioned choreographers of color. So for Lamone, that is Raul Tamez. For the Taylor Company, that is Peter Chu. And for the Martha Graham Dance Company, it's Sonia Taye. These companies are also actively involved in conversations about climate change and arts as a change agent in our educational system. So these are just a few of the topics that we hope to touch on today in addition to your questions. Now it's my pleasure to welcome today's esteemed guests, three artistic directors from these three legacy companies shaping the future of dance. Janet Elber has been artistic director of the Martha Graham Dance Company since 2005. Her direction has focused on creating new forms of audience access to Martha Graham's masterworks and has burnished the reputation of the company as one of the great cultural assets of the world. Earlier in her career, Ms. Elber worked closely with Martha Graham. She danced many of Graham's greatest roles, had roles created for her by Graham, and was directed by Graham in most of the major roles of the repertory. She has since taught, lectured, and directed Graham ballets internationally. Apart from her work with Graham, Ms. Elber has performed in films, on television, and on Broadway, and received four Lester Horton Awards for her reconstruction and performance of seminal American modern dance. Michael Novak became the second artistic director in the history of the Paul Taylor Dance Foundation in September 2018, after being personally selected by founder Paul Taylor to be the official successor of the title upon his passing. A critically acclaimed dancer of the company from 2010 to 2019, Mr. Novak earned a nomination for the Clive Barnes Foundation Dance Award for his debut season and is a proud alumni of Columbia University's School of General Studies, where he received his BA in dance, graduating Phi Beta Kappa and magna cum laude with departmental honors. Under Novak's direction, the company continues its place as one of the world's premier modern dance companies. I'm determined to, fall for, to further Paul Taylor's vision, Mr. Novak said, upon assuming the role of artistic director and to bring his gems to every part of the globe to honor past dance makers and encourage future artists and to make sure modern dance remains a transformative force for good in our lives long into the future. And Dante Pulea, a widely respected former member of the Limon Dance Company for more than a decade, Puleo was appointed only the sixth artistic director in the company's 75 year history, a position that originated with Doris Humphrey. After a diverse performing career with the Limon Dance Company, touring national and international musical theater productions, television and film, 
he received his MFA from University of California, Irvine. His research focuses on contextualizing mid 20th century dance for the contemporary artist and audience. He's committed to implementing that research by celebrating Jose Limon's historical legacy and reimagining his intention and vision to reflect the rapidly shifting 21st century landscape. Thanks to the three of you for joining us. And last but not least, our moderator for today is Carl Flink, artistic director of the dance company Black Label Movement based here in Minneapolis, Minnesota and the University of Minnesota's Director of Dance. He was a member of the Limon Dance Company during much of the 1990s and performed Paul Taylor's historic minimalist solo epic for a retrospective concert on postmodern minimalism presented by the Lincoln Center in New York in 1992. His commissions and invited presentations include the American Dance Festival in Durham, North Carolina, Bates Dance Festival in Lewiston, Maine, the Minnesota Orchestra, MADCO in St. Louis, Missouri, University of Florida Performing Arts in Gainesville, Florida, Same Planet Different World in Chicago, and Urbanity Dance in Boston, as well as multiple TED Talks. He's a two-time McKnight Choreography Fellow and the 2020 University of Minnesota College of Liberal Arts Dean's Medalist. Carl holds a JD from Stanford Law School. Thank you, Carl. Welcome, and I will let you take it away. Great, thank you, Kristen. Um, uh, Personal description, I am a white male uh, with, with gray hair and I have three beautiful paintings by a relative of um, rural scenes in Northeast uh, United States. And I, of course, am coming to you direct from the bunker of my basement in my house as is the nature of the, um, today's world. Um, I want to give a little more focus to our discussion today. These legacy companies that the Northrop will be presenting over the next year are part of a broad American modern dance history that is also powered by the still ongoing legacies of Alvin Ailey, Philodanko, Cleo Parker, Cunningham, and many others. Today is an opportunity for these three leaders to offer their perspectives on potential futures for modern dance in this 21st century. There are many more perspectives on this thing we call modern dance that need to be experienced and heard. And I, for one, know that the Northrop is committed to bringing a wide range of perspectives each year to its stage. This panel is made up of upcoming modern dance companies on the Northrop season, but it is important to not acknowledge that today's panel and its moderators are not necessarily representative of a broad cross-section of our society. However, each panelist has been asked and will be addressing how its organization is affirmatively working to address inclusion, representation, and diversity throughout its organization in their sharings as they discuss the, um, the legacies of their companies. And so with setting that um, platform, I would like to invite Dante from Limon to join us with his on uh, with with on video and say hello Dante and will will you will you as we're starting with you today because the Limon company actually had this transition from its founder before all before all of the other companies today in in the 70s and we thought it'd be a good place to start with you to give us that context of how your understanding of that and how you've also experienced the transition as the sixth artistic director of, of the company. Take it away. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, Kristen and everyone at Northrop, thanks again for having me. Uh, my name is Dante Kaleo, artistic director of the Limon Dance Company. I am coming to you from Manhattan today, uh, ancestral, uh, ancestral lands of the Lenape tribe. I am a white male, mid 40s. I'm wearing a blue, dark blue sweater. I've got some cool vintage posters of Jose Limon behind me. Um, I'm clean shaven, head and face. And uh, that's, that's um, all about me. Um, let's see, so um, Jose Limon created this company, he founded it in 1946. And he asked Doris Humphrey, his mentor, to be the artistic director. Um, after uh, he passed, the uh, leadership went to Daniel Lewis, who was a former company member at the time. And he was the interim the director for a year until Ruth Courier took over for five years. And then from Ruth, it passed down to Carla Maxwell, who was the artistic director for 38 years. 
when Carla Maxwell stepped down, it went to Colin Connor. And then after several years with Colin, um, it came to me. I uh, was a dancer in the company. And I, after, after uh, I retired, I went to University of California, Irvine. And that was where I really started to research the relevance of this work and the power of this work. And I was looking at these stories and saying, do they need to be told? Is this still interesting? How can it be more interesting? How can we engage with the current audience? So a lot of my research revolved around that. I actually interviewed Janet at one point. So it's kind of fun to be here on a panel with her today. Um, so that research ended up culminating into a conversation with the board of directors of the Mo. And when Colin Connor was stepping down, they looked at my research and they spoke with me. And then that turned into a long interview process, which handed, uh, which, which ended up me becoming an artistic director. I got the phone call for this position in March of 2020, about a week into the first quarantine. So it was quite an interesting moment to um, take the reins of a performing arts organization when there were no performances happening anymore. And it really gave us an opportunity to look at who we are, what we're doing, and why we're doing it. Um, it gave us a time to kind of press that pause button that we all, I hopefully took advantage of in that time. And that also shifted my focus into what I wanted to do with the company. You know, there was this, the momentum of jumping in and keeping those programs running and going to the next theater and doing the next show. And then I got to pull back with this time and I was like, okay, well, if we're examining who we are, what we do and why we do it, I should also be examining who Jose was, what he did, why he made the works he made. And that has culminated into my mission for this work, my mission for this company, and how I see us moving forward is by looking at that, looking at who he was, what he did, why he did it, and then revealing that through his works, how we talk about the works, how we reimagine the works, um, the commission choreographies we bring in. Um, and that has started to open up all these doors in terms of the creativity and where this company can go in the future. And I think I'll hand it back to you, Carl. Great, Dante. Before before uh, I pass over to Janet, um, can you talk just a little bit more about kind of the unique nature of the Limon Company and that it actually its a initial artistic director was Doris Humphrey rather than Jose Limon himself, mm -hmm. and and how that kind of I think in some ways may have contributed to how the, these transitions have been easier or in, in some ways easier to facilitate in, in, in the company? Yeah, you know, in the research that I've done and the conversations I've had with the company members at the time, there was this need for Jose to be able to do what he wanted to do was create this work. But he knew that he needed an editor. He knew that he needed an eye. He knew that he needed someone who knew how to run an organization and a business so that his work could could survive the creative process and could go on to live. And I think having that outside eye, having a director that wasn't the choreographer offered him that opportunity to be able to let the foundation or the organization itself flourish while he was able to focus on the art. Thank you for talking a little bit about that, Dante. Yeah. Um, Janet, why don't we bring you on to talk a little more about the Graham Company? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Carl and, and, and Northrop and the Institute for Advanced Studies. Um, I'm delighted to be here and even more excited to be with you in person in April, of course, with our entire, entire company. Uh, so a little bit about our company. Uh, we are the oldest dance company in the United States. Martha Graham uh, began the company in 1926. We're in our 96th season. We are the first integrated company in America. We have many firsts uh, that span Martha's long creative career before her death in 1991. Uh, I came in as artistic director in 2005, I should say at the same time as our wonderful executive director, Lou Rue Allen, who has been uh, a total partner, uh, exemplary partner uh, with me during this transition. Uh, of course, we arrived about almost 15 years after Martha's death. 
But at the time, the company was so busy um, with survival, with questions of intellect intellectual property and ownership, court cases about trademark and copyright, that um, they didn't really have time to ask the question, who are we going to be without Martha Graham? And does anybody care? Um, when I took over, I spoke with a, a well-known dance philanthropist who said to me, oh, Janet, uh, you know, maybe everything has its own time and maybe it's time to let Martha go. Maybe there's an expiration date on 20th century dance. And it was sort of a, the, um, the leading thought of our field, I realized, that was a field at that time about 100 years old that was based on uh, the new of each generation rejecting what had gone before them and revolutionizing and discovering something new. And audiences and funders uh, were uh, presenters as well. The, the field itself was really focused on what was new and um, not understanding the value of our own history and the legacies. Uh, so uh, I was fortunate enough to be involved with several studies at the time, audience participation studies in the arts conducted by RAND and other, the Knight Foundation. And they were in-depth looks at what audiences wanted. And in a nutshell, they discovered that audiences wanted a deeper, richer experience in a shorter amount of time. People wanted to be more engaged. It's the information age. They, they wanted to be able to Google if they didn't understand something. You know, They wanted context, not just to sit quietly in the dark theater. And uh, we realized at Graham that we needed to do a 180. We needed to go from being goddess centric with Martha Graham creating something new every year and audiences would come to just see what Martha had done. We need to go from that to being audience centric and to begin to experiment with giving our audiences as many points of access as possible. Uh, in the beginning, the, the first simplest, most inexpensive thing we did was uh, we began doing spoken introductions to all of our programs. Um, we looked to other art forms because modern dance really had not grappled with this idea of contextualizing its past and honoring its, its legacies. Um, so we looked at the museum's audio tours. Um, we looked at opera super titles. You know, other art forms had, had grappled with this, this idea of balancing its classics with moving into the future. Um, so we began experimenting uh, with all these points of access from our spoken introductions to using narration and media on stage to doing um, contextual programming, choosing season themes like myth and transformation, which was a, for the whole season, we focused on Martha Graham's Greek works, as well as being able to commission a work from Andanus Phoniadakis, for example. Um, we have made unusual partnerships, um, partnering with City Company, the theater company that um, we collaborated with to make a work that um, had actors and dancers in it. Or when we're on a college campus, of course, partnering with every department you can think of, not only dance and theater and the visual arts, but gender studies and American history and um, psychology, um, nursing, uh, we've really reached out and created partnerships with a great variety in the, in the 17 years that LaRue and I have been um, uh, curating the Graham Core Collection. Um, and along with all of these things, of course, as um, the internet became so useful, we did online video competitions like our Clytemestra Remash Challenge or our 19 Power Poses for the 19th Amendment, um, allowing people to engage with Martha's history and her style of movement um, in their own ways, creating their own 19 poses, their own Clytemestra films. Um, so we've really said yes to everything in terms of experimenting. The, the Graham legacy, Martha's works themselves are so fertile, so powerful that we can really mess with them and, uh, and come up with potent art that 
uh, speaks to today's audiences. New work has become a huge part of that. And um, we've discovered that our programs now are about half gram and half new works. We've discovered that the new work brings fresh eyes to the classic works. And of course, Martha's works brings the, the history and the, the substance of our art form um, to the new works. Uh, and there's a real conversation there, I think. Thank you, Janet. I, I, I'm going to just do a quick follow up question right there. Um, I mean, one of the discussions that all of you have to face as a former Limon company member, I was constantly in Q&As about the purity of the legacy. Um, and, and you're definitely addressing that. Do you, do you find yourself at all ever speculate, speculating about how Martha herself would respond to these. I, I, she was an innovator and what you're digging into are the innovative practices of today. Do you, do you ever find yourself on that mind walk about you know, what, what would Martha do? <laughs> well, you just said it. she was an innovator and we want to honor her innovation. So of course I have to say, yes, she would love what we're doing. She would love that we had a two week residency at Google. She, yeah. she was always looking for the next thing that would astonish her audiences. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, it, I don't have it written on my office wall, but I should. That's, yeah. that's, that's really one of the great things I learned from her. I love that phrase, astonish our audiences. I think we could all use a lot of that these days. Thank you for that. Um, so now I, I get the opportunity to bring Michael on to share with us about this very fresh transition that that you're in that has um, you know, been made so much more complicated by the many um, challenges of, of, of the era. So welcome Michael and, and take it away. Thank you, Carl and Kristen, um, for having me. And thank you, Northrop and all the patrons who are um, allowing us to premiere Peter Chu's new work a week from now. I'm very excited to get to Minneapolis. Um, we were supposed to be there in 2020, but the universe had other plans. Um, Michael Novak, Artistic Director of the Paul Taylor Dance Company. Uh, pronouns are he, his, him. Um, I am a white, late, 30s cisgender gay male. Um, I'm wearing a white dress shirt and a grayish black blazer. And behind me are a bunch of photos of dances from our incredible repertory. Um, and I'm coming to you from the Lower East Side of Manhattan on the ancestral lands of the Lenape tribe. Um, Paul Taylor, just to give a little bit of, I'm gonna do the fastest footnote I possibly can. Um, Paul Taylor was born in 1930 in Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania. Um, he actually was a painter and he went to Syracuse University for painting. And he was also on scholarship there as a competitive swimmer. At Syracuse, he was in the university library and he stumbled upon a book on dance. And as the story goes, that's what he decided, that's what he was ordained to do. So he left Syracuse went to Juilliard, auditioned, got into Juilliard, um, had a teacher at Juilliard named Martha Graham, who he studied under, who ended up taking him into her company. Um, Paul Taylor was incredibly tall, incredibly fluid. If you think of Michael Phelps in terms of wingspan, in terms of size, that was Paul, but he was incredibly fast and incredibly strong and fluid. And it was it was a body type in dance that was unconventional. And with that, a lot of choreographers, including Martha Graham, Merce Cunningham, Paul Taylor was a founding company member of the Merce Cunningham Dance Company and George Balanchine all kind of latched on uh, to Mr. Taylor. Um, in 1954, while he was still dancing with Graham, he actually opened uh, his dance company uh, right a couple blocks from where I am right now. And from 1954 to 2018, he created 147 dances that cover an incredible emotional range. Um, several of them have been hailed as masterpieces. Uh, he was known as the master of light and dark in the sense that he could bring you one dance that was knee slapping, guffawing, funny. And then 30 minutes later, he could terrify you. And that emotional range was married with an incredibly fluid style that had influences of Graham, influences of Cunningham, a little bit of Anthony Tudor in there. 
but overall a very painterly eye in terms of how to design work for the proscenium stage. I joined the Taylor School in 2007 through a recommendation from a Paul Taylor alumna named Mary Cochran, who some of you may know if you're a Taylor fan. Um, I was at the school to 2010 where I joined the company, danced with the company until 2018. And after our Lincoln Center season in 2018, Paul Taylor invited me over to his apartment. And he told me that he had been giving this topic a lot of thought and he decided that I was gonna be the one to take over once he was gone. It was not an ask, it was a directive. And I remember whatever facial expression I had at that time, Paul said, yeah, you heard me right. Um, and that's what Mr. Taylor wanted. And ironically, I went to Columbia University. I have a huge passion for arts administration and for balancing both the creative and the intellectual sides of my brain. And I've always been fascinated about curating aesthetic experience for audiences, um, not just what you see on stage with the entire evening of theater. I believe that theater is a very transformative and powerful, not just an art form, but I think there's something actually very sacred about it. Um, so how do we amplify that potential? Um, who are we bringing into the conversations to do so, which we can talk about later on. Um, so I was this is in a way what I wanted to be doing. And I never thought that Paul Taylor would either intuit that um, or certainly give me this position. Um, but I said, yes, of course. And July 1, 2018 was when I started and he died August 29th of 2018. I finished my season performing as a dancer because Mr. Taylor asked me to get out in the house and start seeing his work from the outside as well as still be on stage. So I tried to balance both for a while, um, but in his passing, a lot of things change in a cultural system when the founder moves on. And then we had the global pandemic. So it's been learn fast, listen, engage communities across generations. Um, and really, it's funny that both Janet and Dante are talking about this. I hope we can kind of maybe dig a little bit deeper, but like, why Taylor? Why now? Why do we matter? And I think this pandemic has offered a moment of reflection and a moment of empowerment for all artists about the value of the art form, um, live performance in particular, and how crazy magical it is. And it's changed the call to action, I think, for me, had we not had the pandemic. Um, so I can go into planning and what we're doing and all that kind of stuff later, including Northrop um, and touring, but that's kind of the, that's the abridged version. Yes, <laughs> there, I mean, there's a yeah. depth of history. <laughs> um, I, 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 I am tempted after, you know, the wonderful, um, description of Paul swimming and the fluidity of that massive body to ask you to give us a demonstration of the uh, of Paul's um, back <laughs> exercise but we we won't put you through that on zoom in front of everyone um I think you can go to our YouTube page you'll see a great <laughs> tutorial by Iran buggy who breaks it down step by step <laughs> fantastic well maybe this is the moment where I asked Dante and Janet both to to come back on um, so we can see all three of your faces. Um, let's, I think let's sit in that question of a question that I think has, has I, th I know with Lamone and I'm sure has been the, the case with Graham, this constant question of, of why justify yourselves, things of that nature. But that question, I, maybe we address a little bit, but I really love the way you set it up, Michael, which was why now? What, what is it about these trend, traditions and how they connect to current artists that makes them important engines for change and inspiration during this you know, er, still early part of the 21st century. And, and maybe we'll start, Michael, since you kind of cracked open the question and then pass back through Janet and, and to Dante. Definitely. Um, I think one of the things that our company is known for is expression through a group of people being together. And that's love and loss and darkness and hope. And 
really em embodying your individual space for that within the context of the work. And we were performing at the American Dance Festival a couple of years ago, and this is pre-pandemic, but I think it serves a good point is that, um, I don't remember what was happening in the country at the time, but we were at a patron's house and she had just seen Esplanade, which is a very famous work of Paul's. And she said to us, the dancers, um, you're living in the same world that I am, but you went out on stage and you reminded me what love and joy is. And you made me reflect that I hadn't actually felt that with everything going on. And she got emotional, we got emotional. And it was this, this, this moment of like, for us, getting audiences to feel, and it's okay. It's okay to be inspired. It's okay to be scared. It's okay to question, but that our art opens the space for feeling, which hopefully creates more conversations. And what's interesting in our repertory right now, I'm finding as you go from the 50s to the late 2000s, the work from the 60s, that like post Graham, where Paul Taylor's like wrestling with Graham and his body, and there's what was happening culturally in the 60s and the works that were made, our students are really digging deep into that work. There's something about the grit, where it's coming from, what it was inspired by. So I'm using the past as a lens to help open up doors for both the company and our students and how to help them access feelings and creativity. So the repertory is a tool, I think, to facilitate more conversations. Thank you, Michael. That seems like a good baton moment to pass over to Janet. How would you wrestle with that? Well, totally, the rep, the rep is a tool. I mean, the, the Graham core collection of her 20th century classics are like a springboard. Um, which we've used creatively in all sorts of ways. Uh, our lamentation variations, for example, uh, that started because we had an opening night in New York City on the anniversary of 9-11. And we wanted to commemorate the date. And we said, we're gonna just do a one night only thing. And we invited three important young choreographers, Larry Kegwin, Azure Barton, and Richard Move to create short dances for the company inspired by a film of Martha dancing Lamentation, her iconic solo. We said, it's only gonna be one night. You only get 10 hours of rehearsal. You have to have dance wear costumes, no sets, no props, public domain music. It was very concise. And that night we had three gorgeous gems of contemporary choreography that were totally tied organically to our legacy. And it's just the perfect example of how that the um, depth, the profundity of what Graham created can be taken into the future. Um, I think that uh, there, are, there are other elements to this. You say, why now? Um, yeah. Martha would say, the artist is not ahead of its time, his or her time. The artist is his or her time. It's just that everybody else is behind. So um, I don't know that the pandemic is really a different moment than Martha Graham grappling with the rise of fascism in Europe or the AIDS uh, epidemic or you know any of the of the huge issues that we've dealt with um, in certainly Graham Company's 96 years. We're bringing a work to Northrop in April titled Chronicle from 1936. It's a piece of absolute modernism, stripped down, geometric, a cast of all women. Um, and it was created uh, by Martha the same year she turned down Hitler's invitation to dance at the Olympic games in Berlin. Mm -hmm. But it is not um, stuck in that time, it is, uh, a classic, powerful statement against oppression, uh, not necessarily war. We danced it in New Orleans after Katrina. Um, we've, we've danced it in, in you know, the, the context of the era can shift and the best of 20th century dance still speaks to today's audiences. And when you couple that with 
the today's voices creating work that resonates with our legacies, it's incredibly powerful and relatable. Wow, thank you, Janet. Maybe Dante, I'm gonna pass it over to you, but maybe uh, with an, an, another layer that I know that you have been really wrestling with and it's how do we connect in, in this time with identity and how and, and, and these legacies? How, how do we start allow, allowing ourselves to think expansively um, with casting, with who, who, who gets to dance. And then I have a beautiful question that I, I'm gonna throw out to all of you again from one of our audience members. But, um, and Dante, of, of course, feel free to go wherever you want, but just knowing from conversations we've had that, that that's something that you've really been digging into. Yeah, this idea of using dance as a tool is such an interesting aspect of what we're doing and why we're doing it, helping define the now and the reason behind the now. My first project with the company as artistic director was um, was reconstructing there as a time, which we did over Zoom. Uh, our first rehearsal was um, on June 1st, 2020. And I was living in Harlem at the time. And I have the computer going and we're working on a section from there as a time called Time to Speak. And it's this clapping series, this rhythmic structure that's happening. And while it's happening, Outside of my window are protests. The George Floyd civil uprising, Brown and Telly, this whole story is happening outside of my window while my company is on the computer just clapping and dancing time to speak. And it was the most mind blowing experience of how particularly relevant, not only the work, but this moment is happening in both places at the same time. So, and my dancers are feeling this, you know. So, after the rehearsal, we had you know, major conversations about how they were feeling in this moment, dancing this work, and how much they're able to bring of what they're personally experiencing that day into that rehearsal experience. And it really set the stage for, for digging into the relevance of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, you know, and then, you know, Janet, you were talking about the work as a springboard, and that ties into the reason I'm, you know, we're here today is Kristen and I were talking last year and I was looking at this work of um, Jose's called Tonantzipa that he made in 1951. And it celebrates the Mexican Baroque era through this chapel in Mexico called Tonantzipa. And in the chapel, you see generations, you see like a brown baby Jesus. And then all of a sudden you see a baby Jesus with like lighter brown hair. And then all of a sudden there's a baby Jesus with blonde hair and blue eyes. And you can see this arc from what this small Indian chapel was 300 years ago and what it is today. And Jose made this beautiful work celebrating the Baroque era and this art. And our commission with Raul Tamez was looking at the other side of what that is. So now we're examining, examining that work in a new way. And I think that that is like a great, that's the springboard that, that um, Janet was talking about. And I think that really sets the stage for how we can impact audiences today what we're talking about, how we engage them and bring them in. Um, yeah, yeah, and you mentioned, yeah, you mentioned identity. Um, yeah, that's a big question. How do we, how do I cast? Um, I, have a, I have a range of pronouns in our company from he, she, and they. And Jose Limon wasn't, he was working in the binary. So many of the roles are male and female roles. Um, so I'm interested to hear <laughs> how other companies are working with that in terms of this structure, but that's the constant question is, how do we best live inside of this work and bring it forward so our audiences are engaged with the diversity that's inside the company and our audiences? Beautiful. Thank you, Dante. I, I'm going to go uh, offer a question from, from our audience that I think goes into you know, another layer of the current um, dialogues and in dance. Um, the audience member asks, I would love to hear more how modern dance companies are thinking about the body now that we are all trying to think more about differently abled bodies, since part of how dance astonishes its audience, it often involves incredible bodies that seem to have superhuman abilities. Something, and this is something that this audience member has been mulling, 
how how do we i mean because quite frankly some of our the, the some of these founders really talked about dancers as the chosen ones and think and had these really strong languages um of superhuman-esque capabilities and what does that even mean and how how do we complicate this notion of the dancing body in these legacies and i'll i'll just you know michael janet or dante please just jump in you know if you feel like you'd like to take hold of that first uh, i'll start it's really difficult it's hmm. really difficult as dante says you know jose was working in the binary so was martha uh, and uh, she had an aesthetic of the sort of hero male figure. Uh, it, it was it actually in the design of her choreography that the men are, you know, she had Paul and Bertram Ross and Stuart Holds, all these six foot, six foot two guys. And it's really part of our choreography. So as we ask these questions about ableism and about how, how the dancing body uh, needs to be addressed these days, we have begun to, in our audience access efforts, we have things such as our 19 poses challenge, which turns over to the viewer 19 poses that Martha Graham created. And they're accessible to, uh, uh, any non-dancers even, any size or shape person. Um, they are mostly arm gestures, so you would need the use of your arms, but they're given to you to perform, to, um, we've had embroidery created out of them, we've had artworks created out of them, we've had a competition for people to use them in everyday tasks and send them photos. So it's a lighthearted, um, exercise and yet we we feel like it's one way that we can begin to open the door um great thank you janet michael dante i mean i would just i i think it's i think it's an it's, it's a very important conversation to be having right now as someone um who has inherited um pre-existing work and connotations um <clears throat> of of beauty, ability, and excellence, and what those are and how we define those moving forward. I will say within the Paul Taylor canon, there are there are roles that are in a binary universe and there are ones that are not. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm grateful that Paul often actually, more than people might know unless you got your casting sheet, um, that Paul was at many times looking beyond gender and looking for a certain type of presence or a certain type of look that came from a person's energy. Um, I understudied women in the company for roles, never got to perform them, but it was, it was common that if he was looking for a certain um, power or refinement or elegant, that it was beyond gender, that it was that, that's what that piece, that, that energy was needed at that time. Um, and he also built his company with a wide range of sizes and heights. We have small dancers and tall dancers. He, he the, the tailor look was one of power, but uniformity and expression, not in like size or type. And the repertory is built on that. So it's actually, I feel like I have flexibility to ask the question of like, what are we doing now? Who is the best artist for the role? Um, and then have conversations about casting accordingly. Um, but then you have the reality of partnering and you have some lifts that are just, the choreography requires a dead press of a human being over your head in one second. That's, it's an anathe that that's required of the work. So how do we use the repertory at the right time to make sure that the artists can succeed and they can shine as well. I think we all ought to weigh in about our schools here also, because we're talking about a very particular professional aesthetic here for our companies. But in for the Martha Graham School, um, it's a wide range. We're interested in the process and the experience for the students who come to our schools. They're not all necessarily 
planning to be a Martha Graham dancer in the Martha Graham company. Um, they have a wide range of goals. And so um, there are a wide range of body types and we are embrace that and certainly think it's part of our goals as a school to provide for that. Yeah, I think education is the key aspect of what we're talking about, especially with differently abled bodies. The Jose de Mon technique based on the Humphrey work is really about fall and recovery. So whether we're talking about the theme of the work, the hope, the striving for something, um, falling and then recovering, that can show up in many different body types and no matter where you are in your physicality, just that idea of what falls and then what recovers and then letting that pure intention resonate in any way you're, you are able to use your body. So I think that that's another portion of, of how we can be effective with our legacy, with this work, with these stories, with mm -hmm. differently able bodies. And I think it's creating safe spaces in which that can happen. And that students come to our schools knowing that this is a place where you can express yourself where you are and that that space is held for you. I think that's, it's, a, it's essential always, um, but right now and going forward, certainly. Yeah, and I, and I think I think it is it's it is one of the truly open questions of the day in in, in across the dance world, um, because it has been something that has been invisibilized at times um, during during the history because of this celebration of a certain type of virtuosity. And I really appreciate your your and your responses to that. Um, I, I have a, I, I think a really nice question from one of a, the audience members, um, uh, kind of asking each of you to you know, just expressing how the wonderful balancing act you all are, are are having and being dance artists performers who have made this transition into um artistic direction and leadership they, they wanted to hear about you know what training and skills have you developed and sought out in order to take on these heavy um, uh, arts administration duties as well. So um, maybe Dante, you could start there, you know, uh, maybe CrossFit training for yourself. I don't know. So what arts admin yoga have you been doing? <laughs> That's a great question. And I talk about it a lot because as a leader, there are so many things I was unprepared for um, in terms of the level of imposter syndrome, um, the worthiness of having this position, um, and how that ends up showing up when I'm in the front of, when I'm in the front of the room, you know, that, that, that want to invisibilize yourself. <laughs> You're like, well, you can't do that. that this is not that moment. Um, so I think for me, it was a lot of watching, listening, um, and like not being afraid to speak, speak the truth in that moment. Um, I know that for the company, we have been doing a lot of leadership training because I came into this unprepared especially in the light of a pandemic there was so much onboarding and I was like gosh there were so many things I wish I had known because I felt I I I created my my idea of leadership through who not to be and taking it away from the people that I was seeing in leadership oh, I don't want to do that I don't want to do that I don't want to do that so then I ended up just judging myself on doing all those things I promised myself I wouldn't do and I was like well what can I do to set my company up better because it looks like a company member will eventually be taking on this role in whenever that happens. So what can we do now to have those conversations to set them up better? Um, so it's a it's an evolving conversation for me at this point still. Awesome. Thanks, Dante. M Michael? I've spent a lot of time. Well, it's funny when you started your question, I was going to say, I thought you had about experiences in your past. And I was like, yeah. waiting on tables actually <laughs> did a lot more for me than I ever there. expected um, in terms of managing and multitasking and trying to create evenings of people with different ideas of what they, you know, uh, but I think it's, it's figuring out what type of a leader I want to be and I am organically and owning that as, or figuring out how to use it as a skill set. I'm very much a thinker and I'm very much a synthesizer. I like hearing everything and pulling things together. Um, and there's a different mode of leadership, which is this is where we're going, period. You know, And 
owning that like, no, this is how I actually am the most effective and the most honest is by being true to myself. So one of the things I've been journaling a lot about recently is like authenticity as it relates to not just being me, but being me in a leadership role um, and unpacking that. And what's been interesting about the pandemic is I think it rapidly accelerated that process because we stepped into a universe that very few people had any idea of what it was like. Our um, rehearsal director, Betty DeYoung, who joined us in 1962, she's still here and her, her mother was a nurse in the Spanish flu. So she remembers and she knows so a little bit of a heads up, but there's been this kind of the etch a sketch erase moment of like, we're all figuring this out. What are you doing? And that actually was oddly empowering because nothing else, there was no precedent for it. So you could focus right on education to Instagram, free classes immediately. Like all these, all these things had to happen at a rate where innovation was needed every day so quickly that I think it, 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 it forced me to mature faster as a leader. And you're also dealing with, to be honest, because we were rehearsing with the company at the end of 2020, you're dealing with the survival of your artists, to be perfectly frank. We're talking about a very deadly virus that is killing people. So the, the, the marrow of the work that you're doing, it's not just creating art, like you are responsible for the lives of the people that are under your wing. And that, that'll wake you up. You know, absolutely. But I mean, you know, Michael, it's not, I mean, the, 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 you know, serving tables, all of those experiences, you know, it's so easy for people to think of the specialization of the, of the professional dance artists kind of clears away all of this broad life experience that in many ways we need to weave together to, to get, um, a broader understanding. And, and it's probably one of the reasons why Paul said, you know, called you over to his house that one day and said, I, I'm telling you that you're going to be in this role. <laughs> so thank you for that. Janet? Yeah. Well, I have a lot of, I have a lot more life experience. I think I'm probably twice as old as either of these guys. I forgot to ID I myself earlier. I'm a, a white woman who's 70 years old with a salt and pepper ponytail and black glasses. And um, I've had, I say that every experience I've had before becoming artistic director has served me. Even being a mother, um, certainly dancing on Broadway, da dancing things outside of the Graham legacy, being in Hollywood and doing TV shows. I mean, one of the biggest things I learned in Hollywood was that nobody knows who Martha Graham is. And that's what I brought back with me as I became artistic director and said, we need audience access. We, we need to be doing work that um, is compelling to those, there are audiences out there that we aren't getting to. I also did a stint at the Dana Foundation running their arts education uh, granting for teacher artist training, which I learned a lot about arts education, of course, and a lot about budgeting and how arts is funded. So I've just been lucky to have a wealth of experiences that, that really serve me well. And of course, working with Martha herself is at the top of the list. Uh, thank you, Janet. Um, yeah, going to another question um, that I think actually in a practical way addresses some of the why now and where we are. Um, An audience member has asked, can you talk about um, the kind of dancer that you're looking for? Are you looking for, uh, at, for dancers who are training heavily in your specific technique now? Or are you looking for dancers who are exploring a vast range, a balance of the uh, between Both. the two? Yeah, they, but but maybe you can you know sharp. I, I was suspicious that might be the answer because yeah. of the, the vast the, the the repertoire that we're that you're starting to expand to. But can you talk a little bit about? why both is is important um, to to developing a company of this nature in 2022. Uh, yeah, and Janet, why don't you start there? Yeah, I mean, we since we started commissioning new work uh, over 10 years ago now, 
um, our dancers were solely Martha Graham dancers, but they have had to expand and do wildly different styles from City Larby Sharkawi to Marie Chouinard to uh, we just finished a new work by Hofesh Schechter. The work we're bringing to Northrop in April has eight different choreographers um, that come from the background of hip hop, of Chinese classical dance, of Afro-Caribbean. Uh, it's I'll, I'll give a plug here. It's called Canticle for Innocent Comedians. And Paul Taylor said when he saw it, um, when Martha Graham launched it, it's the reason he became a choreographer. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's a side sidetrack. <laughs> it, it's a lost work by Martha Graham that we are reimagining with eight different choreographers. So our dancers, uh, now when we audition dancers, we expect them to be quite expert in the Graham technique, but also to be able to um, uh, just jump into a whole variety of contemporary styles. Great, Dante. Yeah, I'm looking for, it's, I have a cute little anecdote where I had my first audition um, in October and I'm sitting next to Risa Steinberg and she says to me, well, what are you looking for? And I was like, I don't know. I know it when I'll see it. You know, it was just, yeah. I needed the artists in the room to speak to me. I need to see artists that I think will speak to my audience. Um, and I needed, an I needed artists that responded to the company that, that I'm working with currently. So I needed them in the room with me to see if the energies were working together, if there was a camaraderie, if there was uh, some kind of gelling that could happen. And that was, that was, the, that was the process for me. Okay. Michael. I would say one of the things that Paul Taylor did at the beginning of his auditions until the very, very end, and it's something that I continued at every audition we've had, the dancer walks by themselves from one side of the studio to the other to a drum beat, and that's it. And back in the day, from the walk, Paul would cut. Yep. Because if you can't walk, and not, and when I say walk, I mean, if, you, if you're forcing something that's false, it reads so fast and so clear. And it's a terrifying walk by the way, because um, you can't hide behind anything. And I still do it. And it still is one of the most revealing things about people. And I am looking for dancers who know the Taylor style. And I'm looking for dancers who, you know, can kind of go back and forth with contemporary choreographers and Paul's work. But more than that, I'm looking for how people treat other dancers in the room. I look for little tells when someone messes up in a combination. Do they laugh? Do they commit to the wrong way? Do they get frustrated and, you know, we just, you know, walk off? Um, you're looking for a personality that is gonna be with you on the road at 10,000 feet, you know, with jet lag, understudies going in. And if their, resp if their response, is like, yeah, let's do it. I'll teach you how to do a scoop in a V. But that changing, changing someone's constitution is very hard and I don't have time for that. So when I, I'm looking for that and it's hard, it's like Dante was like energy. It's, it's a weird thing to see it, but you see, you're like, bingo, it's done. Yeah. I, yep, that's it. And it, I don't know how to describe it. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's kind of an uncanny moment that you're like, that's, and I'll do company class too. I'll bite, like, I'll do a reduced, you know, group down and I look at how they move with the company. And like, you look for chemistry, you look for which two people all of a sudden you're like, I just cast five pieces of rep with those two, like all great dancers, but they're looking for that little thing, you know? And it's and it and it and it isn't categorizable. It it really is a an alchemy, right? That some mm -hmm. that it, you, know, you you may see a, a mover that has never you you've never seen move that way and go, my gosh, I just have to have that in in the space. So, but it, but it is really helpful to hear about that kind of balancing act of knowledge of the form, but also just a, a, a uniqueness of movement. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kind of switching to, I think I, I think I'm going to try to combine. I'm getting a lot of questions rolling in, so I don't know if we'll get to all of them. But kind of a, a, a I'm going to try to merge two questions. There's a question about how 
these legacies work to also make room to support the rise of smaller dance companies and, 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 and help create the ecosystem across, in this context, the United States of, you know, to create space for smaller organizations to rise up. I mean, because I know that this is a, a ongoing discussion has been for a long time about there's these, these kind of mainline companies at the top and they've all been there for a while and how do we filter up? But maybe not sit there so much in the barrier of it, but in the, like, how does then your work of choosing choreographers for repertoire and artists, how do you see those activities um, of your companies um, contributing to a healthy ecosystem at all levels of the dance, of the dance world? Um, Dante, maybe start with you. Yeah. yeah, this season for the 75th anniversary will be at the Joyce April 19th to May 1st. And on our first program, we're working with a choreographer. His name is, his name is Olivier Tarpaga. He's from Burkina Faso. And I heard him speak a couple of years ago and he was talking about his early life experiences. And he was talking about growing up during a revolution. His father was a musician. And I was like, wow, bing, bing, bing. Those are the same formative experiences that Jose had. Wouldn't it be interesting to pair those stories? What does this artist, what is this artist talking about? Compare it with what Jose is talking about and then see what the overlap is. See the conversation between those works. Um, so I wanted to work with him. So we had the opportunity to do that for this season. And it also worked out to be a great opportunity now for Olivier to be brought into this broader perspective more eyes on his work, more eyes on his name. And now he, he'll be performing with his company at the Joyce in two years. He'll be going to the pillow in a couple of years. So there is this on road of introduction by working with us that these other relationships have started to form. So I think that is um, one way we have found to start or to continue that evolution and feeding the dance field as a whole. Great. Uh, Janet, I feel like you, you've already been scratching at this with a, a number of your comments. Maybe you can go a little deeper with that. Yes, I, I, I think it's I, I think it's really important that that um, us legacy companies are also looking to um, uh, allow our legacies and to lift up the field and to inform the field, if you will. Um, we recently partnered, well, I was invited to be on a panel, the 92nd Street Y for their future dance festival. And it was um, filled with young choreographers who were allowed to have no more than one commission before they applied to this festival. And the talent was prodigious. And I was really impressed. And we decided to turn over our Saturday matinee at the Joyce to um, allow eight of these choreographers who were in the New York area to show their works. Um, and in fact, we've commissioned um, Baya and Asa, who were part of that festival, to do a, a new work for us next season. So there's that, but there's there are other things. I mean, we have a, a vast licensing department, um, and we make it affordable mm -hmm. for smaller companies, for universities, to license the Graham works. We allow them to use the lamentation variation format. Um, we uh, invite invite people to create their own works based on our legacy. Um, so there, there are a number of different projects. Um, I, it brings me to something that I, I think we should be looking forward. As I said in my earlier remarks, the field of modern dance when I came in really hadn't recognized its past. And I feel like we have at this point. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, the Taylor Company is also uh, dancing other classic works from the 20th century. And Stephen Petronio is bringing the postmodern works in. And there's a real honoring of our past. And I think one of the things the field could do is now come together to look at that past in the context of. Um, of what's happening today in the context of DEI and the way people are looking at the monuments that are being taken down in cities and um, what in the 20th century deserves our um, study and our um, speaking of airing and dealing with um, that uh, as, as every other field is really doing. So I think that's the, 
field of modern, modern dances, maybe next task is to join together to understand better our history. Thank you, Janet. Michael, any thoughts on that? I mean, it's a perfect segue, actually. Thank you, Janet. <laughs> um, that, um, in 2014, on our 60th anniversary, Paul Taylor launched Paul Taylor American Modern Dance at Lincoln Center. And he was obsessed with this idea of, we were all Paul Taylor all the time until 2014, after for um, 60 years. And then he, long before my appointment, he set this new tone about building an inclusive space at Lincoln Center that presented the art form. And it was much broader than just Paul Taylor. And it was more broad than just commissions. It was about looking at historical dance that was impactful from the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, and we presented Pasacalia by Humphrey. We presented the fabulous Diversion of Angels by Martha. Shen Wei came in. We did a tribute to Donald McHale um, after his passing in 2019. And we brought in Ron K. Brown and Juilliard and Dayton Contemporary Dance Company um, that we use our privilege in that space for audiences who particularly knew ballet and the opera and are starting to learn, you know, this modern dance thing, um, that we use our privilege in that space to get other companies in there and to start opening up their palettes in terms of what else they might be interested in seeing because they might see not just a new work by Kyle Abraham, but they might see something by Ron K. Brown that is it historical, yes, but you could also see Ron K. Brown just going downtown and that you're propelling the ecosystem. In terms of education, one of the things that we're doing with choreographers who come in like, like Peter Chu um, and his company Chu This and Omar Ramon de Jesus, who's gonna be choreographing on our company later this year and his own company, Boca Tuya, they're teaching master classes here in our school and it's an opportunity to get students that you know you may not become a tailored dancer but you might take a class from peter or omar or any of our guest choreographers coming in who have companies and you might be like this is my calling and then i'm in a position as a director to facilitate that peter there's someone here who i actually think might be really great for you are you having an audition so Education becomes much more than just training for our style. I think it becomes about connecting students to the field at large. Um, even with both of your companies, it's like, I have this amazing student, Dante, Janet, like worth looking at, you know, help them grow. So I think those types of conversations and using our platforms, whether it's education or theaters, um, to open it up a little bit and think more inclusively about everything. Wonderful. Um, taking a big right turn or a related turn, but um, going to a wholly different subject, one that is absolutely as pressing as many of the issues that you've already talked about. And, but one that we highlighted at the beginning is something that we should touch on. And we live in an era where there is massive conversations, research, and things of that nature around climate change. Um, you know, how, you know, if and how are your companies working to engage that, that topic, which quite frankly hits at every identity issue across the globe? And so, yeah. Uh, it, the, that's a, one I'm not going to, I'm going to leave it wide open because I have a feeling there's multiple different answers that might be happening within your companies. And uh, Michael, I'll maybe throw it over to you to, you to start out with, because I'm just seeing you uh, nodding your head. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> um, no, I think it's an incredible, I think, I, I think it's one of the many important things that we're having to address and confront right now. I would say that my primary focus in addressing climate change is with presenters um, and the producers of works as it relates to touring, as it relates to prog uh, like programs um, and you know, advocating for what can we do and what can we do better. Um, we are all touring companies. You know, modern dance really is rooted in the travel system. Um, and it's my, I've experienced this even in my nine years you know, as a dancer in the company is that the impact of climate change on travel 
is changing things. It's changing the reliability of how fast you can actually get somewhere into your show the next day. We have to build in a little bit more contingency plans depending on the season. So how do you work with presenters and producers from a like economic, almost capitalist mindset? Like we've got to get there sooner. It's hurricane season. We don't want to risk it. What do we do? Right. Um, and who's covering those costs? Because we are non-for-profit dance companies. I mean, we're all successful legacy companies, but those are expensive choices to be making. So how do we work collaboratively in those costs to ensure that our art does get out there um, and do it responsibly? Great, thank you, Michael. Janet? Yeah, I think you're touching on a, a big thing. I wasn't gonna go to the travel thing, but I mean, the carbon footprint, the field as a whole, is this a question should to be asking? Is the touring model uh, unsustainable? And should producers and presenters be going back to, in my day, the 70s of dancing? We called it block booking, where if you went to Los Angeles, you also danced in San Diego, then you went up to San Francisco, and then you went up to Portland and Seattle and Vancouver, and you know you, 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 your gigs were close enough together, so you weren't getting on an airplane and flying to Beijing and flying back to New York having done two shows. So I, that's an issue I don't have an answer for. I just think it's something, something to think about. We are, the, the work that we're bringing that, that Northrop has co-commissioned, Canticle for Innocent Comedians with our eight choreographers is a reimagining of Martha's Ode to Nature. So it is um, made up of eight vignettes, sun, stars, wind, earth, moon, and um, it will, we hope, open conversations. It, it's, it's not a rallying cry. It's, it doesn't proselytize, ties, but we hope it will be, um, you know, a work of art that addresses, uh, addresses the topic. And it, it, we are trying to be conscientious in every way. For example, our, our Karen Young, the wonderful costume designer, is designing costumes for us and has discovered a, a polyester fabric that is made out of recycled bottles, plastic bottles that we'll be using. And it'll have digital printing, which is much more um, environmentally safe than certainly dyeing or even screen printing. So we're looking at all the, the angles. Um, feels sometimes like a drop in the bucket, but um, it's, it's something we all need to be aware of and keep talking about. Yeah, but that, but yeah, that it, certainly the drop in the bug, bucket phenomenon can exist, but that the ability of these platforms to amplify these techniques um, to broader audiences, I think is, mm. you know, one of the places we can really, you know, those small steps can have, can have a, a, a broad resonance, Janet, and I really appreciate that, you know, you sharing those ideas. Um, Dante. Yeah, I think if we're looking at our footprint, and we're gonna be traveling somewhere, I think the kind of impact we can have if we're going to make a footprint, if we're going to travel somewhere, are we doing just one show or are we actually engaging with the community? So we're not just doing one thing, but we're actually having conversations, teaching classes, meeting, educating, building. So it becomes less about just that one thing, but then we are actually doing something inside of that world that we're entering into. So it's, still going to create the footprint we're creating by doing the touring and the traveling, but we're actually doing more than just that while we're there. And I think that could be a part of how we address it. Um, yeah, and then like Janet was saying, like the work, like what work are we doing? And how are we speaking about it? So people mm -hmm. are aware of it. And over the summer we did a work, we took the winged, Jose is the Mons 1966, the winged out of the proscenium and did a film. And it was in nature and it was the work about birds and flight happening in Colorado. So you got the Rocky Mountains and you had the, you know, the plains and the fields and it was beautiful and it really gave you that sense of being in nature and giving that appreciation. So mm -hmm. we're actually having that conversation. So there, as I'm kind of scrolling through the variety of questions that we're getting and Everybody out there, I really am working hard to try to get as many questions asked as possible, but I will not get to all, we will not get to all of them. But I, there is a thread, a common thread that I want to address with a kind of general broad question. And it's one that actually, quite frankly, my dance students at the U of M ask me every year we're in a composition mm -hmm. class. Um, 
Can you each talk to the almost impossible to answer question? What is the difference between modern dance and contemporary dance? And I would love to hear your efforts to um, not tie yourself into knots with that lovely question. <laughs> Um, Dante, I'm going to ask you to tie yourself in that knot right away. Oh, that's that right so away. rude. I have to be first. Go on, Dante. Go, I'm the newest go. one. Go. Take it. <laughs> You're contemporary. We're modern. <laughs> right. um, for me, I think it really talks about the age in which the work was made. You know, so if we're looking at that mid-century era, that's how that's how it's formed in my in my mind. Um, they were contemporary artists of the time, but that work has now been encapsulated as modern dance. Um, and I think the work we're working, like there's a hybridity within the modern dance world from other forms. And now those modern forms have turned into another form of hybridity. And I think that new hybridity of all these modern dance forms and ballet have shaped this world that we're now living in that we call contemporary dance. And that's my um, $2 short answer. And I'm gonna pass it on off, let someone else talk about it. <laughs> All right, I, I, I'm, I'm, Janet, I think you're up. I'm, a, I'm as confused as anybody, I, I don't know. I mean, we, we are the Martha Graham Center of Contemporary Dance and, and we're almost 100 years old. So um, I, I don't know, is contemporary dance dance of today? And in three or four years, that contemporary dance becomes part of modern dance? I, I don't know, I'm, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't have a scholarly opinion about this. But you have an opinion and that, and that matters. <laughs> I, I don't know if we need to worry about scholarly, um, but, but thank you, Michael. So I grew up not hearing the word contemporary dance. Mm -hmm. Somehow it got used and invented and kind of injected into the mainstream at some point. And I'm fascinated to know what the next word is gonna be because I feel like it's been about 20 years, 25 years of this contemporary, not when I say like Paul was using it in 1974, like it's been around, but like this, like it's contemporary. Like it's, um, what, like what are we, are we post-contemporary next? Are we neo-contemporary? Like, like someone is gonna label whatever's gonna happen after this pandemic, which, I do want to talk about because I'm very excited about like the future of the actual field. Um, but I, when I think of modern, I think of design and I think of designed theater. I think of visual artists, I think of sets, I think of um, expression, and I think of codified styles or techniques to build a repertory rather than kind of a open it up and this is the experience. And I think we're sitting in this moment right now where I don't necessarily, I kind of want to claim the modern back and I want to, I want our company to like modernize the modern. Like, no, we are rebellious. We are reactionary. We are going to do things that have never been done. Mm -hmm. Like, cause that's what our founders did. Right. All of them, they all, reacted and then forged their own path. And I, in that spirit, I wanna claim the modernness. Be like, no, we are a modern company and you all better get ready to see what happens. <laughs> like what a modern company can do. Cause you could call it an era. I don't think it's an era. I think it's a perspective and an approach. Michael Novak throwing the gauntlet down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, Ah, wow, we have had a really wide ranging discussion, you three. I, I can't appreciate enough how much, um, how you've dug in here to this range of questions. I just wanna um, just give each of you a, a brief opportunity just to you know, share one more thought that you would want to leave our audience with about maybe the direction of, of your company that where, where you're going that maybe we haven't touched on just you know one one small nugget as a you know as a parting goodbye to our audience maybe janet start with start yeah I'll, I'll i'll start um i tipped our hand we're turning 100 in 2026 hmm. and uh we are through this transition where we put our legacy as a springboard to the future we are the Martha Graham Dance Company, the first and the future going into our 100th. And we are looking for partners to astonish 
I'm talking to you, Michael and Dante, and <laughs> museums and musical groups and anyone who wants to create a lamentation variation. And um, we're, we're cooking up uh, a big celebration for the company's 100th. And of course, we have many marvelous projects between here and there. So um, we're looking forward next, of course, to being with you in Minneapolis. Yes. Michael. Three things, new voices. I have five world premieres in 2022. I'm very well, subject to change, but that's the plan. Um, and really showing the power of the Taylor dancer to extend themselves both kinetically, but also emotionally beyond what audiences might expect. And new voices are gonna do that. And then new New York for me. Um, new York is our hometown travel the world, global company, but doubling down on our New York audiences and the New York art scene specifically in visual art design um, and how we can start creating more collaborations um, that cross boundaries and start really innovating. And the last thing is I sincerely believe that we're about to enter a major renaissance in dance. I think two years of not seeing live performances, artists in bathrooms and closets and living rooms choreographers creating on Zoom. I think there is going to be some extraordinary art made also because of spaces that are now safe for more diverse voices to come in and to start really having the space and the platform to share their stories. So I think we all better buckle our seatbelts and start doing some massive fundraising because I think it's going to be big. <laughs> I really do. Great. All right, Dante, bring us home. All right, uh, Lamont Dance Company. Um, Brand new branding, new, new revitalized energy in the company, in the direction, in leadership, celebrating 75 years. We'll be at the Choice, April 19th to May 1st. After that, we'll be at Jacob's Pillow. After that, we'll be at Vail Dance Festival. After that, we'll be at ADF. So you can catch us all around the country, seeing our two new commissions, our amazing new repertory, seeing the Limon Works as you've never seen them before, seeing Limon Works that he choreographed that the company has never performed. So we have a very big year coming up. So please check us out, lamon.myc, see so where our performances are, reach out, find out how you can connect with us. And I look forward to meeting everyone on, on um, our first tour. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you three. And I see that IS director Jennifer Gunn has come on to uh, close, close our event. Thank everyone in the audience for all of your questions and enthusiasm. And there's all kinds of social media access points to any four of us. So don't hesitate to forward those questions that didn't get answered to our organizations. And we will hopefully respond that way. Jennifer, take it over. Hey, thank you, Janet, Dante, Michael, Carl, and Kristen. And um, most of all, thank you to all of you who came from so many time zones and brought your depth of experience to this conversation. And we look forward to seeing you all again next week, same time, uh, and also on Zoom. And I just want to say uh, this will be recorded. This is has been recorded, and the video should be available available um, through the IS website uh, in about a week. And thank you all so much. This has, um, I heard the words new and innovative uh, many, many times in, and it lifted my heart and you've um, set us on the right path for a new semester. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you. My Jennifer. pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you all. Hope to see you soon.